This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. If you have felt a little impatient in the last half hour, I know someone much more sinful in that respect. He's talking to you. Nonetheless, it's a joy to be here. Matter of fact, at my age, it's a joy to be anywhere. (laughs) I beg of you not to be put off by the title assigned me for this lecture. It could just as easily have been what is the Bible's chief metaphor on how to get right with God right now despite sinfulness, failures and follies. The word forensic sounds so metallic, impersonal, cold, but it just means according to law. And law is codified love. Law is not God's creation, it's God's nature. Law is alive on God's throne. Sways his scepter, basks in his glory. Without it, you and I could not survive five seconds. Law tells us that the universe is not haphazard. Law tells us that the secret of lasting joy is obedience to law, physical, mental, and spiritual. In a talk of this nature, technicalities often prevail. I cannot do that. Life is too brief. Most of us here will die unexpectedly. Only a handful of people out of a hundred die of real old age. The rest of us die of accident or sickness. I cannot play fast and loose with the opportunity to do what I can that we might meet together around the great white throne. A little girl who asked too many questions <coughs> was told that curiosity killed the cat. She said, what did the cat want to know? <laughs> and what do you most want to know in the little time left? What do you most want to know? We have a triangular relationship in life, relationship to God, our author, creator, sustainer, lover, redeemer, relationship to ourselves, relationship to our neighbour. We can't accept ourselves unless we know God accepts us. And until we can accept ourselves, we cannot accept our neighbour. 
So to know that God accepts me is the most important issue to be solved today. And I say today because today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. Thank you. We don't know whether we have a tomorrow. There's a real conundrum. The Bible says without righteousness no one will enter the kingdom of heaven. And then it says and there's none righteous. The answer to that conundrum is what the Bible calls justification. Seventy times in the Pauline letters more than reconciliation, propitiation, ransom, redemption, adoption. Seventy times. Whole chapters are devoted to it, like Romans 3, 4, 5. That's true of no other metaphor. This is the word that released millions from spiritual thraldom in Europe in the 16th century. This is the word that changed England and later in the 18th century saved England from a revolution more bloody than that of France. This is the word that motivated Luther, Calvin, Knox, Zwingli, the Wesleys, Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards. This is the word that Spurgeon sent around the whole world to kings and queens of Europe, to university students and professors, to the wheat fields of Canada, to the gold mines of Australia, pastures of New Zealand. This is the word that transformed broken-hearted, depressed, guilt-ridden men and energised them to the blessing of millions. Never despise this word. It's the biggest word in church history after the name Jesus because it's about what Jesus does. The NIV translates it in 2.13 and 3.20 as declared righteous. There's the genius of it. It's a word of grace that says to me, Des, you're a rotter, but I love you and I died for you. And just as you are, in all your folly, in all your weaknesses, I accept you. I accept you. And justification is a never-ending donation. It's not just at the beginning of the Christian life. Romans 5 says we stand in justification, being justified by faith. It's a never-ending donation, the grace of God over this penitent sinner. So the penitent sinner knows that he or she is accepted in the beloved, complete in Christ, despite a thousand peccadilloes, failures, mistakes and sins. So be careful what you do with this word. It's the biggest word of the New Testament after Jesus and Calvary. It's the answer to our conundrum. Dr James D.G. Dunn says this word has had incalculable influence. I quote him because he's not a friend of fundamentalists and you may think I'm exaggerating. But Dunn says, justification, the word of incalculable influence and of priceless value, it must never be made peripheral. Must never be made peripheral. Because the church that loses justification loses its reason for existence. It loses its dynamic. It has no love to impart in a way that convinces. One of the greatest New Testament scholars, Schrenk, in most important New Testament reference work, 
It says in Paul's usage, the Greek word for justification is plain and indisputable. All scholars of worth are agreed that the Greek word for justification means not make righteous, as though we're reformed, but accepted as righteous, declared righteous. That's the glory of the gospel. At the end of the day, despite all my failures and fumblings and bumblings, I can say, thank you, Lord, and go to sleep with the assurance of eternal life, knowing I've got the verdict of the last judgment right there. And if I fall into a deep pit, the same is true. I am accepted in the beloved. I'm complete in him. And there's no condemnation. The sins of the believer are not reckoned against the believer. Romans 4.8 God doesn't record them. When our Lord died as our representative, he took all our sins of yesterday, today and tomorrow. And I am in him by faith. I was at Calvary, for I've been crucified with Christ. I've been buried with him, Romans 6.4. I've been raised with him, Colossians 3.1. I'm now seated in heavenly places with him in the merciful recting of God. You too, if you believe, if you receive, same thing. Believing, receiving, same thing, same thing. But there's a spanner in the works. This wonderful word of grace for those who are graceless. But the spanner, of course, is willful sin. So Christ, recognising the reality, could say, if you then, being evil, what a statement. The lover of men taking it for granted that those listening to the gospel were very far gone if you then being evil of course none of us love as we should pray as we should trust as we should serve as we should none of us we're sinners all our days and yet accepted. What then should we say to the great judge in whose sight the heavens are not pure, who charges his angels with folly, by whose brightness the stars are darkened, by his strength the mountains are melted, by his anger the earth is shaken, who will dwell with devouring fire, who will live with everlasting flames. He that speaks the truth in his heart, whose obedience is flawless, willing, fervent, total, consistent, joyous from morn till night. Nothing else is acceptable to the law. And yet, we lawbreakers who falls short in all those areas, hear the words, this man receiveth sinners. He's gone to be guest with him that's a sinner. And we hear the words of the Saviour, your heavenly Father has mercy on the unthankful and the evil. What a verse. What a truth. What a God. He's kind to the unthankful and to the evil. And so here's Barabbas, your second name and mine. Condemned to death. A very bad man. Nothing he could do. And Jesus takes his place. 
And Barabbas goes up that lonely hill and wonders why that man on the central cross should have taken his place. Dear friends, we're Barabbas. Jesus has taken our place. And there's the penitent thief, a rogue all his days. And Jesus says to him, paradise, paradise is yours. What? Paradise for thieves? Yes. For adulterers? Yes. For murderers? Yes. For thieves? Yes. For the spiritually slothful? Yes. Paradise for all who receive. Paradise for all who believe. Here's a woman taken in adultery. And Jesus says, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. But how can he say that? Because soon he would be flogged so that by his stripes her wounds would be healed. Soon he would be condemned, so she would be justified. Soon he would be stripped, so she could be clothed. Soon he would be mocked, so she could be honoured. What a saviour. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood. Sealing my pardon with his blood. What a saviour. What a saviour. And so for you and for me, justification is the open door into the temple beautiful of the Christian life. But it's a door we keep passing through again and again and again. It's more than forgiveness, it's acquittal. God says, I'll count you as though you'd never sinned. So many translations use acquittal. It's more than acquittal. It's the imputation of the merits of Christ. That's better. Christ was treated as I deserve, as I might be treated as he deserves. He became what he was not so I could be treated as being what I am not. No wonder the gospel is the power of God under salvation for whoever believeth, whoever receiveth, whoever You don't have to be good to be saved. You do have to be saved to be good. It's not a matter of who you are, but whose you are. Who do you belong to, the devil or Christ? We do have a part to play. Not a striving to have faith, but a looking off to the faithful one. Faith is God's gift to all who hear the gospel if they don't reject it. And so salvation becomes a matter of grace. By grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Because of grace, Justification is called a gift five times in Romans 5. Righteousness, a gift, a gift. Not only a gift, but a free gift. Suppose I tell you that my wife says, Des, I, I've fixed my eye on a beautiful watch for you, for your birthday. It'll cost you $160. God knows we're stupid, so he says, free gift free gift. It's true. It's true. It's true for you. You've all heard of Bertrand Russell, 
the sceptic, the British philosopher, lived to about into his 90s. But you may not know that his daughter wrote about her parents. They were brought up in a dry religion of morality without grace where the commands were many and impossible and they were defeated and depressed. If only someone had told him what Karl Barth learnt from Romans, that religion is grace and ethics is gratitude. Religion is grace. Religion is gift. God is better than we have ever hoped though we're worse than we ever suspected. Millions of Adventists have been like Bertrand Russell at Minneapolis when justification by faith was first preached. Ellen White said it's the first I've heard of it in 45 years except in conversations with James. Well, what on earth were they preaching? They were stabbing people with the mark of the beast. They had a hate tirade against our brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church. But most of all, they talked of law, 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 law. They hadn't read where the New Testament says, I through the law died to the law, that I might live under Christ until you die to the law as a method of salvation, you are lost. I, through the law, died to the law. We never die to it as a standard. We must die to it as a method. There's a beautiful statement and I confess to you that justification began to caught my soul when I was 15 when I read again and again the little book Steps to Christ and there's a statement there that runs like this there are many who profess to serve God but who rely on their own efforts to keep the law to form a right character to ensure salvation their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ such religion is worthless and a heavy burden dear friends to be a Christian is to have joy unspeakable and full of glory every day and sin doesn't have dominion over you because you're no longer under law as a covenant. You're under grace. Justification is the opposite of condemnation. And condemnation doesn't mean to make bad, it means to declare bad. But God gives his gifts with both hands and he justifies no one, he doesn't sanctify But the righteousness of justification is 100% but it's outside of me. It's in him, Christ. Righteousness of sanctification is inside me. It's never 100%. So you never worry about how you're doing but how he's done. Until the guilt of sin is removed, there's no power over sin. You cannot break vicious habits till your guilt is gone. Now my friends, I'm going to read to you from two passages of scripture, absolutely vital. Would you look with me please at 2 Corinthians 5. Here in 2 Corinthians 5 and verses verses 14 to 21, we have the explanation why God can be so gracious how he can forgive justly, how he can honour the sacred law by forgiving the lawbreakers. 
Here's the answer. Chapter 5, 2 Corinthians 14. <coughs> For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Please note, it does not say, therefore all need not die. He was our substitute, but this is talking about him as our representative. What he did, we did. Luther said, mine are Christ living and dying, as though I'd lived his life and died his death. Mine. This is the great exchange. Please look at verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Christ was made a curse for us. The sin of all the ages was focused on that sacred head. O oh, sacred head now wounded with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded with thorns thine only crown. How does thy vision languish which once was bright as morn? Because he was made to be sin. Treat as though all sin was upon him and that he'd been guilty of all of it. Why? Last part of the verse. In order that we sinners might be made the righteousness of God in him. Look now at Mark 14. <coughs> Mark 14, verse 33, Gethsemane. If you understand Gethsemane, you understand the Gospel. If you don't understand Gethsemane, you do not understand the New Testament. Listen. He took Peter, James and John along with him. He began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. It was though a horrible apparition met him in Gethsemane that chilled his blood and seared his nerves and brought him to the brink of death. He's there in the valley of the olive press if it had turned one half turn more, he'd have died. Why? The Holy One, the Spotless One, God has withdrawn from him. The atonement has begun. Friends, beware of any theology that leaves out the atonement. Beware of any theology that denied that Christ was a sacrifice. And if you have doubts, read the last verse of Hebrews 9, first half of Hebrews 10, about six times. He was a sacrifice. He was an offering to God. He died paying the price of the second death. It wasn't the physical pain. Why is that sky dark? Why is the sun withdrawn? Because God the Father has withdrawn. He could not smile upon the prisoner at the bar. The darkened heavens revealed the darkened soul of Christ. My God, my God, why has Thou forsaken me. All people say he wasn't really forsaken. Then Christ was a liar or at least an error. Oh no, he was forsaken. He was forsaken so you and I might never be forsaken. 
Dear friends, never minimise Calvary. Half of John's Gospel is about Passion Week. Third of Matthew, Mark and Luke are about Passion Week. Given 350 times more space than any average day of his life. The Bible is a cruciform book. It's about Calvary. The hiding of God's faith. He experiences a second death. He's going through the agony of death. Far more than physical death. Beware of any saccharine gospel. Beware of any cheap gospel. The gospel is about a tremendous extravagance. God emptying his soul out for rebels. God in agony for rebels. No wonder then that Paul in Galatians 1, look with me please. We're going to look at verses 6 to 9. When you read Paul, you hear thunder. He met Christ on the Damascus road and instead of a self-righteous Pharisee became a humble, believing child of God. But still very intolerant of error, not of people. Look at verses 6 to 9. I'm astonished you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and you're turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently some people are throwing you into confusion trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than one we've preached you, let him be eternally condemned. The gospel meant everything to Christ. Does it mean everything to you? The gospel is not like plasticine. It's changeless like God. It's everlasting like God. And it has power like God. This is why Luther could win the millions This is why Wesley could transform England. Whenever the true gospel is preached, there's power. Don't despise the testimony of the Holy Spirit. Centuries of history testify that the Holy Spirit has worked through the gospel of justification to change the lives of millions of sinful men and women who were without hope. The testimony of church history is that the Holy Spirit has validated this preaching. This is why men could go like Judson to Burma, Hudson Taylor to China, Gilmore to Mongolia, This is why men could go to the islands of the sea that were cannibal. Gospel has power. Power of God under salvation to everyone. Great heart or little faith to everyone who believeth. Look with me now at Romans very quickly. Apart from the Gospels, the most important book ever written. It's caused many revolutions. F.F. F. Bruce said, if you'll study this book, it'll mean cataclysmic change for you, but wonderfully for the better. 
It's a book about justification. Remember justification and righteousness are the same word. Adventists took 150 years to learn that and then promptly forgot it. I was with the meetings at Palmdale where day after day we noticed that whenever Paul links righteousness with faith he is only ever talking about justification. Not justification plus sanctification. That robs you of assurance. The great lacuna in Adventist Christian experience is a lack of assurance. Adventists get to 80 and 90, not quite sure which direction they're going. But righteousness and justification are the same word. Righteous by faith, to any Greek scholar, means justification by faith. So you don't have to be cast down by your mistakes because your salvation is in justification. But it always produces holiness of life. But it's the general direction, not every act. Because formation of character is a lifetime task. We're accepted at the beginning. We have the verdict of the last judgment. Moment you believe. You have everlasting life the moment you believe. John 5:24. What more could you ask? So in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And he goes on to say, there is the righteousness of God revealed. Literally, a righteousness from God. When Luther read it, it scared him to death. He said, how can I love a righteous God when I'm so unrighteous? One day the light broke through and he saw that the righteousness from God was a gift of righteousness to whoever believed. He said, paradise was thrown open. He said, I had the key to the Bible. He said, my whole life was transformed. Salvation's free. Righteousness is God's gift to all who believe. The early chapters are written like a lawyer's brief. Chapter 1, Paul looks at the unbelieving world and he says they're lost. And in chapter 2 he turns to the Jewish world, the believing world, he says they're lost. Then in chapter 3 he says, let's face it, the whole world is lost. What things, however the law says, says to those that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. The whole world may become guilty. So there's a terrible hush in heaven's courtroom and the world is silent. Then an advocate stands up and collapses and dies. But after a beat of three he rises and he says, but now, but now, a righteous from God is revealed for all those who have faith. For God has sent forth Christ as a sacrifice of expiation or propitiation for sin that whoever believes might receive this gift. God has done it that he might be just. Notice it's a moral forgiveness. It's not a Father Christmas sentimental daddy daddy. That God might be just. It repeats it twice. That God might be just. And these verses, none of them are about the happy feelings that the believer gets such as what we call the moral influence theory teachers. None of it's about that. It's all about what God has done legally. And never forget, to be legal is not the same as legalistic. Your marriage is legal, I hope. But I hope it's not legalistic. Legalistic is a perversion of the legal. Don't confuse them. You know, there was a man by the name of Horace Bushnell... He influenced millions of 
Christians by teaching what became known as the moral influence theory that Christ's death was not a sacrifice, just a gesture. God loves us. As though you're sitting on the edge of the jetty before the sea and a friend runs by you and jumps into the water and drowns to prove he loves you. You're not even in danger. That is a moral influence theory. That the death was not a sacrifice, just a gesture to warm our hearts. Horace Bushnell taught it spread like wildfire. But before he died he took it all back. He wrote another book. He said there's no fruitage of holiness in the moral influence theory. We must preach the atonement. We must preach the propitiatory sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Calvin said every Christian should read Romans as the daily bread of their soul. Luther said it's the chief part of the New Testament and the purest gospel. Tyndale said it's a light in the way of the whole scripture. Godet said it's the cathedral of the Christian faith and the greatest masterpiece of the human mind. Coleridge said it's the grandest thing ever written with a pen. It's all about good news. It's the only systematic book among the letters. And it's the first letter out of a series of seven churches. The seventh church is Thessalonians. Those letters are all about the second advent. But the first letter, Romans, the most important letter, the biggest, the only systematic one, it's about the meaning of the first advent. And Adventists have been well up with the Thessalonians. We're stuck on the second. We've missed the glory of Calvary. And therefore, as some of our pioneers said to each other, we preach the second advent but we're scared to death at the prospect. We're not ready on the, for the second advent unless we understand the first. Unless I'm right with God this minute, death has terrors. Second advent has terrors. Judgment has terrors. But if I understand the cross and I've received it, nothing has terrors. Neither death nor life, nor principalities or powers. For nothing can separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus my Lord. So the first five chapters of Romans develop how the gift of being declared righteous is for all who believe on Calvary. Then in the sixth chapter he moves into holy living. He says, you want to live a holy life? Then remember you're not under law as a covenant. You know the Living Bible is very good on Romans 3 verse 19 onward. It says, now do you see it? No one can ever be made right in God's sight by doing what the law commands. The more we know of God's laws, the clearer it becomes we aren't obeying them. His laws serve only to make us see that we're sinners. But now God's shown us a different way, not by being good enough and trying to keep his law. Now God says he'll accept us, acquit us, declare us not guilty if we trust in Jesus. And we can all be saved in the same way. doesn't matter who we are or what we've been like. There's hope for the hopeless. Hanging on the cross, Christ was the gospel. This is our message. Dear friends, heaven is not light years away. Heaven's no further than your thought of recognition that God loves you as though there was no one else to love. That brings heaven very near. This is why the great hymn writers were so good on the gospel. Paul Gerhardt, Charles Wesley, Isaac Watts. Read those hymns again and again and sing them again and again. 
And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Saviour's blood? Died he for me who shed his blood? For me who caused him death? Amazing love. How can it be that thou my God shouldst die for me? No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him are mine. Alive in him, my living head. And clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. My friends, I have a legitimate five minutes. Will you witness your witness to the testimony I have offered you from Holy Writ? Are you prepared to say, Des, this is the gospel that saved my soul. Des, I'll be with you at the great white throne. I'll be there. And I'm not ashamed today here in this Adventist congregation to say, this is my gospel. This is about my Lord. This is my only hope. Dear friend, if that's how you feel, come down. Come down, we'll have a prayer. Come now. Come now. Thank you for loving us. We know that no one can ever love you unless convinced that you love him or her. And yet here's this great commandment to love you with all our heart, mind and soul. You can love us into loving you. We can't hammer the rosebud open but your gentle love can open our hearts. We thank you Lord God. We thank you our Saviour and our Redeemer that you looked upon us and our sin and you spoke to our hearts. You told us that you loved us. You told us that you accepted us. You told us that we are yours. That death has no fears. That judgment has no fears. That we have everlasting life. We have the verdict of last judgment. We have the continual donation of being declared righteous. And there's no condemnation for we are accepted in the Beloved. Thank you, dear God, for all your grace in Jesus on Calvary's cross. Amen. Thank you for your witness. Hello, this is Elise O'Brien with your daily promise from Yah's Word. Do you ever feel lonely? If so, you're not alone. A general social survey claims that the number of Americans who say they have no close friends has nearly tripled since 1985. There are many reasons for this. Loneliness has been shown to be, believe it or not, contagious. Also, the internet contributes to a feeling of loneliness felt by many. What's ironic is that many turn to the internet to alleviate those feelings of loneliness that, in fact, are made worse by the internet. The reason's simple. The internet provides a quick fix to loneliness. Contacts are just a click away, but the effect isn't lasting. In an article written for Forbes magazine, Caroline Beaton stated, one reason the internet makes us lonely is we attempt to substitute real relationships with online relationships. Though we temporarily feel better when we engage others virtually, these connections tend to be superficial and ultimately dissatisfying. Or, as one study she quotes puts it, quote, 
Online social contacts are not an effective alternative for offline social interactions, unquote. Loneliness has been a problem suffered by the elderly, but now, among Americans, it's millennials that complain the most of feeling lonely. If you are feeling lonely, Yahushua is the answer. The very last words of the Savior, as recorded in Matthew, are a promise. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. You are never alone. That's a promise. Let your faith lay hold and cling to it. We've been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. Have you ever been troubled by various commands in the Old Testament telling the Israelites to wipe out this city or that population and kill everyone, including women, children, and even babies? It doesn't seem consistent with the Creator's character of love, does it? Well, there's a reason for it, though. Find out what it is. Come to our website, www.worldslastchance.com. Click on the tab that says Biblical Beliefs and read Nephilim in the Bible. Learn why such commands would be given by a loving father. That's Nephilim in the Bible on www.worldslastchance.com. For the serious Bible student, World's Last Chance offers free online e-courses. These are perfect for individual study as well as topic and discussion guidelines for group Bible study. Sign up today at worldslastchance.com. been listening to WLC Radio. This program, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available for downloading on our website. These are great for sharing with friends and Bible studies. It's also a wonderful resource for those worshipping Yahweh alone or at home. If you would like to listen to Radio WLC programs, visit our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the home page. This will allow you to download the episodes in your preferred language. There are also articles and videos available in a variety of languages. been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ 
at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. <laughs>